Hi guys, um, welcome to today's uh, chat session. Um, okay, let me bring our uh, guest speaker on and screen as well so that you can all take a look at him. Then I'll kind of give a small introduction as well. Yep, yes, Mr. Philip. But um, okay, uh, okay, small. Okay, this is a joint chat session that we are doing with the Hyderabad Canyon Club as well. I want to tell that out first. And uh, we have here Mr. Philip Butt, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Commander Canals Industrial uh, Security Services Private Limited. He is also the Secretary of the Hyderabad Canyon Club. He is uh, a certified detection and production trainer. A uh, wheeler trained in UK, Germany, China, and Finland. Uh, he has trained a lot of dogs, close around uh, 1,000 dogs across India, and he constantly upgrades his skill. I mean, in the sense, uh, I think uh, him and his dad have been pioneers in dog training and security services in India, and uh, he himself has like been include. He himself has been upgrading his skills in FCI obedience, tracking detection, uh, handling and production. Uh, FCI uh, tracking detection shows handling and production. So welcome, Philip. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yes, uh, today's topic, as you all know, uh, you can see a scroller as well, but let me just read it out. Benefits of positive reinforcement in dog training. Um, okay, this is something that I think every person who's bought a dog has a question in their uh, head on how to train a dog. And we have one of our best person to basically uh, talk about it as well. Uh, uh, so they basically is where, okay, uh, Philip, okay, let me start off by asking, what is uh, positive reinforcement. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. And uh, I must tell you, it's an honor that uh, we are doing this together. It's a pleasure and honor that you thought of me. And, uh, and it's really a very nice initiative taken by NCC. And once I heard what you were doing, I said, we want to be part of it. And it's so kind of you to allow Hyderabad Connect Club to also join up. And I think we, this will be the first of many things we'll do together. And, uh, coming to your question about uh, what is uh, positive reinforcement, uh, I want to I have a small presentation because there is a lot of confusion about positive reinforcement. People tend to think that uh, you know, if you feed your dog while training, that's positive reinforcement. So that is possibly the most wrong, uh, one of the wrong interpretations of positive reinforcement. Just using food. Is not is not just positive reinforcement. We need to, I, I made a very small presentation. I have it somewhere. Yeah, yeah, here it is. So I have it on the screen, uh, and uh, let me try to. Uh, just a sec. Give me a second. Yeah. yeah. Somebody is. So the uh, positive reinforcement is just a. Uh, Another type of operant conditioning. Can you see this on the screen? Can you see in Rajan? Are you able to put this on the screen? I just came and I think it just popped out again. Uh, just came and went off, isn't it? Wait, let me play it from the system. And play it from here. Share screen. Yeah, I think this should be on screen. Yeah, yeah. This is a, yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, positive reinforcement is just another type of operant conditioning. Okay, uh, so we, are, uh, we are not able to see the PPT, but uh, we are able to see something else uh, as such. Uh, I don't think the PPT yeah, is on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, the, the, we are not able to see the presentation that you want to show. Uh, yes, I'm hoping you can see it. No, no, it's not. No, we can't. Okay. Rajan, I need a help here. Are you here? Wait, let me get Rajan on me. Okay. Just a second. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's loaded. Yeah, now it's loaded. Perfect. Yeah, okay, great. So now we're talking about the four quadrants of operant conditioning. Uh, it, it, uh, it's, often it's confusing uh, because, uh, uh, but I'm just I'm putting this in very lay terms because, as you had mentioned and as we planned, uh, this is just for a 
very obvious of technovers. We are not going too much into technical training, but we just want to get some doubts out of the way. So, uh, so there are two ways that I can get behavior out of an animal. I can do something good, or I can do something bad. Okay, when I say it in lay terms again, and, uh, when I say something good, uh, something good would be something like using food, or toy, or praise, or loving and petting the dog. These are good things. You know, this is obviously these are good things that I would use to get behavior from a dog. Then what no. bad then bad things would be scolding, shouting, and I've heard some horror stories and people do find very, very unique ways to torture the dog into getting him to listen. So I won't get into different things, but something like scolding, shouting, hitting, using a choke chain, using a spike chain, using an electric collar, all these other bad things out there. No, okay. When we talk about good and bad, so we, I think we all know that we don't even want to use the bad, we all want to use the good. But then what we want to do? When we come to that, first let me talk about the bad stuff. When you use the bad stuff, okay, then if you use more bad stuff, if you add more bad, as you can see here, I've highlighted, and it's called positive punishment. That is, if you hit the dog, or if you use a church in strongly, or if you whatever those give him electric shock, you don't sit, I'm going to give you a shock. So you're adding more of the bad stuff, then that's positive punishment. The underlying feeling for the dog is fear. And then the, if you do bad, it's not a good thing actually. So negative reinforcement is a, is a term I hear very often. People think that maybe it's something good. It's not good because a negative reinforcement, you are taking away something bad. It is like pulling the spike chain or pulling the choke collar and when the dog sits, you take away the pressure. You release the pressure. So what you're doing is you're saying, okay, when you release the this bad thing. First you apply it. It's only after you apply the bad thing you take it away. That is why um, negative reinforcement is also not a good thing. And the no. fear there and the feeling there also for a dog is fear. Then we come to the good stuff. Good stuff. Two possibilities are add good stuff or take it away. So when you add the good stuff, it's positive reinforcement. No. That's what positive reinforcement is. So when you add good stuff, which is you add, you give him a toy, he listens to you, he gives him food, he listens to you, you're giving him petting, you're giving him Anything that you give him is uh, positive reinforcement. Okay. So what is negative punishment? It sounds like a bad thing because it's got the word negative and punishment in it. But it's the second best thing out there. Second to positive reinforcement. When I say, when I say second best thing, basically it is like telling your child, uh, no TV till you finish your homework. It's not too bad, but you feel frustrated. It is like, So if I tell it in the dog world, it is not a bad reward. So I have the food in my hand. The dog is like, give me, give me, give me, and I'm saying, no, give the behavior, and only then I'm going to give it. Till the time that he gets the food, he's building frustration, and then frustration gets him to do what he wants, and that is negative punishment, which we are not here to talk about. But I think I clarified very uh, clearly positive reinforcement is when we use a lot of reward to mark and identify the behavior that we want. So that, that is what I'm going to do this thing now. So this is positive reinforcement. Oh, okay. So, have you always been a positive reinforcement trainer right from the beginning, or is something that you adapted over a period of years or something like that? Yes, yes. I think a never ending process, unending process. I don't know whether I'm ashamed or not of it, but it's a fact that I have been a correction based trainer earlier. We correction based, I have been myself. Hundreds and hundreds of trainers who are watching this right now uh, to give corrections to the dog. And I've justified it by saying that we are a balanced trainer. We cannot point these guys. We can't let them on the head. I remember I myself wrote an article that was around 12 or 12 years back or so saying, you know, you can use a clicker and positive reinforcement to train a dolphin, but then you don't need a dolphin to stay in a living room. That was my argument. So the dog is going to stay in a living room. You can't use these, you know, these. Uh, Frivolous method, you need a strong hand, you need to dominate the dog, you need to tell him who the boss is. This was the kind of things that uh, I was, this is the kind of world I came from. And uh, uh, over time, I'll just pick it. I'm just getting some comments here that there's some echo, so I'll just try to switch up the Bluetooth thing yeah. and get it out of the way. Hopefully, this is better. Can you hear me now? Can you just speak for me to my voice? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, fine. There is some echo. 
there is definitely when i am speaking when you are speaking i can hear an echo and i'm sure no, I, uh, anyway can't help it yes yeah. so uh, now coming to uh, so this story of uh, positive uh, reinforcement i have not always been a positive reinforcement trainer but i think it gives me a unique insight because uh, i used to meet positive uh, you know, reinforcement trainers back in the day. there used to people who there used to be people who never used correction and they would never understand where i am coming from when i am telling them to no, use correction other things they would understand me but now when someone tells me that they they feel so they know that i know that i have done it i have got the results but other than correction based training was something which was very prevalent uh, to start with i think yes. everybody kind of changed a lot of things yes. uh, Yes. And the rules, I mean, in which you are you now allowed to handle or show dogs, are also changed in the right way. Yes. Yes. I think it's the same with us. I, I, I should, we got whacked around a lot by our own children. So times have changed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we are getting in some questions from our viewers as well. Uh, okay. Put up some there. I think it will be. Most of it is about the voice echoing, so that is when I, yeah, I got that now it is better. But there is a small echo. I'm sorry, we can't do much about it. Okay, how do we first get uh, again again start? Okay, uh, again the trust of a dog for very positively important before starting a training session, and how to realize that we are in the right part of starting a training. Okay, that, that's uh, that's a good. How do you how do you get a dog to trust you that you're going to do the positively important? Is the question by Mr. Nitesh. Okay, I'm seeing the pictures first. How do we gain trust of the dog about the rule? Starting a training session. How do we guys get on the right path? Okay, yeah. Actually, it is not so much uh, about um, positive reinforcement only. I think uh, for any training, uh, when we tell the step of training to anybody, the first and foremost step of any training is relationship. I mean, without relationship, you cannot train a dog. If the dog doesn't know you, he's not going to obey you. And listen to you. So that's not going to happen. Uh, for you, for us to, you know, for us to uh, be able to, train it, we should be able to. The dog should love me. I would say. So, if I am training someone else's dog, which is mostly the case with us trainers in India, I take time. I mean, that time is well invested. Rather than being in a hurry to get results and say that the dog is better than me, I would take time. Depending on the dog, the dog who will decide whether I have two days. Uh, whether I need two days or twenty days, it's for the dog. I have to give him his space. I can't say no, 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 no. no. I'm the biggest trainer in this area, and you have to start with him. Because you know, once I touch a dog, he falls in love with me. I have the sharp claws. Doesn't work that way. Uh, I'm sure that yeah, okay. I mean, we need to look at the dog. A good understanding of dog body language is important. In very experienced trainers, other than my own students. Uh, not being able to that and it was something we were not putting too much emphasis on here. Nowadays, when we conduct courses, it's uh, the first foundation course that we do, and it's important that the person understands what the dog is feeling before we can start training. So, Niti should say the first. And um, uh, yeah, if I want to know if the dog is comfortable with me, put aside he's looking, he's anticipating my arrival. You can see the smile in the body. It's not the face smile, but you can see. The It's relaxed. There are no signs of uh, you know pressure or stress when he's approaching him. He's not talking to me. Any of this stuff. Now he knows that yeah, okay, uh, he's come. My friend has come. I'm not yet his daddy. I don't expect to become his daddy. But yes, ultimately, I would want the dog to be you know for me to be his dad. So uh, that is not the time. Usually, if he accepts me as a good friend, then I know I already started on the right path of training. I will then take it from. Okay, adding to Nitesh's question, I have something which you were talking about. So, what is the right age for uh, for you to start training a dog in the positive reinforcement uh, type of a way? I mean, like you start at the very early age, puppies, right? So, what what is the right month or the this time you start off with training? Yeah, I think the age for starting is not decided by uh, so much by what we call um, when the dog is ready. Is more like when is it healthy to train him? When is it safe and healthy to train him? Okay. If I was in my own kennel, I start training them when they're thirty-five days old. I have thirty-five, uh, fifty-day-old puppies which are being trained on stay some of the basic commands that I like to teach. They learn it before they're even two months old. 
but I wouldn't do this to somebody else's dog because I am coming from a kennel where I am, you know, carrying so much uh, infection on me, and if I go to a dog which is not vaccinated, then it is not advisable. So it really depends, and this it depends is going to be an answer for most of the queries because when I ask any of my trainers and the dog question. The answer I get most often is it depends, and that's what is going to happen here. So if I am training the puppy born in 30 days, it's as early as 35 days. But if I am coming to your dog's house to train this dog, then I don't want you to give me your puppy to be seven or nine months old. But if you are training your puppy, you would have picked him up when he is around two months old. Start the day you get him. So it really depends on depends on these factors. Oh, okay. उटिंग Who has written this? I, I'm not able to see. It's from where we came from, uh, because uh, we used to believe that okay, positive reinforcement for a certain type of dog with a certain personality, who is willing to take any sort of it, who is happy and compliant and wanting to please. He said, "Oh, this is the kind of dog which can be trained for positive reinforcement." Where the dog correction is unavoidable, especially a dog which is aggressive. And uh, I'm sorry that uh, I know. That I got the same result, positive reinforcement that I got through correction and training. The same dog which would bite someone is now not biting me because I'm using. I have uh, enjoyed the results of using both methods. And, uh, of course, positive reinforcement is not the dog. And if you can get the result without being cruel, then why would you not rather use a method that is easier for you? So yes, a dog which is disobedient and short and I'm also. Being aggressive there uh, will definitely be will definitely be tied to positive reinforcement. I also have two videos. I'll try just. I have the dog. Uh, I'll just take a break. I'll just bring this on. I have a dog which is here in my kennel right now, which has undergone around three months of training. The dog bit its owner. When the dog came here for admission, it bit one of my staff members. The staff member. I just took this video today because I was thinking, okay, I might get to the question. Just a second. Let me bring this on. So this boy was bitten by the same dog sometime back. Now I'll just show you the video. And the next time I'll show you the video. And I'll show you the video. And I'll show you the video. Listening to him. I will not ever forget him. I will put it up on screen. Okay. Okay. okay, this is not working. So, dogs also, which are able to, you know, uh, the bitten people are thereafter listening, obeying, and accepting food from the same person. Dogs okay. that are aggressive to others have changed. So I've seen it, used it, tried it, and it is not coming from you know some utopia idea of mine. It is me actually using. And the uh, American team has done it. We use very strong correction for the same dogs. We use no correction for the same dogs, and we get the same results. I can assure you that that's all. Take a longer time for you to correct a dog like that uh, than your regular uh, for this thing, or does it take the same same time for you to get the dog to come into the positive no. training? It, yeah, it's a good question. It takes longer. It takes okay. longer. Yes, yes. So correction is very very effective. Uh, As far as results are concerned, if you are looking only at the result, correction is, I think, the best way. Because if you know how to use it, like you know, like, like we knew, it's still uh, effective. And uh, your dog is immediately doing everything, like uh, giving up the bad behavior. You know, that's what happens. You get this in a very short time. But the problem is that the dog is not happy. The dog okay. has shorter life plans. The dogs have uh, so many other stress signs. The dogs get into get diseases. They get ulcers. Uh, you can see them uh, biting themselves, just spinning around in the kennel. These are all signs of a dog which is going half mad. And, you know, uh, when you are training him, he is like he is only thinking how do I avoid getting 
I mean, we never used to hit the dog in the field and we used to justify that, you know, we are subscribing. But the dog is only sitting there thinking, how do I avoid the next jerk? As a, if a dog who's trained to positive reinforcement, like, how do I get the next thing? Using his brain. Okay. Giving you the behavior, and when he gives aggression, he doesn't get it, and he doesn't give aggression, he gets the, the, the dog, and he starts going towards that direction. Okay, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. This is what you have to offer. Whereas the dog which is which you're going getting aggressive with, he's saying, You are going to attack me, I better attack you first. Till finally you are able to overpower him and you much stronger than yours, and you break his will, break his mind, and then he says, Okay, boss, you are the boss, I will do whatever you say. So I don't think that's the way I would want to be with my animal. And it's way better. It's way better. It takes longer. But I can tell you, uh, it's always there at the back of the mind of a dog which has been trained to correction. He okay. wants to get back in another situation with another person. He may probably get back to his bad behavior. As I guess when you use positive reinforcement, you may take two longer. So that may take a month. This may take two and a half months for an for an aggressive dog to get rid of the behavior. But after two and a half months, the dog has given up that life for good. It is like correction training for good. It's better that way rather than someone standing with the gun and saying, if you correct your dog, I'll kill you. What will I do? I won't correct his dog as long as he's around. Next dog or the same dog when he's not around, I'm going to use correction. So it's something like that. Uh, we have a question for one of our viewers, uh, Sri Devi, uh, Sri Vidya. My dog, Sidhu male, is more uh, dependent with me, afraid of sound and not going alone and, and play with other dogs, urinates while leaving with a new person, very shy. How do you rectify this problem? I mean, is there a way to uh, do rectify such kind of problems, do possible reinforcement as well? Uh, or is it only yes. about or general training as such? No, I would say it's still positive reinforcement uh, because uh, I'm going to try this again, okay? So just give me, bear with me. Yeah. Uh, okay, oh, let me see where I am. Okay, for some reason you don't see this. No, it's not working. Fine. So uh, there's this thing called a desensitization. Okay? Desensitization means you slowly, slowly get the dog used to whatever he's not scared of, or whatever he's not comfortable with. So it could be so some of these things that I see here, sounds and uh, when you leave and a new person comes. Some things like this. Of course, this is not a one solution for everything. This is not a single yeah. problem. Yeah. 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 But uh, I think a, a desensitization is something we should speak about. Uh, and it is it is in, from the world of uh, positive training. And I've seen this, uh, thankfully, I was never doing it, but I've seen this solution where if a dog is scared of loud noises, people just put him in the room with loud noises and hope that he will get out of the fear. That doesn't work. I mean, that is too pretty. It will be a scared of. You are scared of a dark room, and I put you in a dark room for two days. Would your scare fear become more or less? Maybe in that state, it will become less. You don't want to be in a dark room, dark room for the rest of your life. So, in uh, comparison, what I would do is if a dog is scared of a loud noise, I would play a very soft music, a very funny and see how he keeps to normal behavior. And I see he's comfortable with this, and either I increase the volume or I bring him closer. And Sounds was closer, and then slowly, depending on the comfort level of the dog, I would get him to again, depending on the dog, I mean, it may take from the kind of dog she's expecting, I would say two months. I need to play a full value with her next year. It will take two months of comfort and effort, and every time each training session should not be more than five minutes. And every time I see the dog getting uncomfortable, I can't push it closer or louder. That is when I know this is not his comfort level. I have to move him comfortably and then bring him closer. So desensitization is what we use a lot for a lot of the problems. Uh, but you also need to know body language and uh, be able to read. When I say the dog is getting uncomfortable, people read when scared. So when he gets uncomfortable, he's just small size, like licking his wrist. It's a very quick thing that happens. 
I actually take a video of every training session. So I'm able to see in two more that the dog actually did this. That is a sign of stress. The dog yawning is a sign of stress. The dog, you know, putting his tail, I mean, the bigger sign of his ears back and his tail under his, uh, between his legs. Those are the bigger signs. People wait for that. That's too late. The slightest interest is when you need to say, okay, this is where I need to cut off. So, uh, understanding of body language is necessary. And once you understand body language, then you can slowly, slowly get him used and that shits out of a lot of fear. Um, I would need to, you know, be a very one on one with this dog or, or and owner and guide them. Yes, positive reinforcement is a solution, but it is an advanced solution. If someone has come and done a 10 day course with me, they are not trained. To do behavior correction, okay. they, they are just trying to teach basic, uh, behaviors like come sit down and stay. Yeah. So you need to be more advanced to be able to do that. So then, like uh, the lady who asked the question, I don't expect her to over the phone or the video or the nuances of uh, and uh, such things, uh, which are used for uh, removing such behavior. Yeah, counter yeah, about uh, counter uh, counter conditioning as well. No, Hmm. So, yeah, so I was speaking of counter conditioning. Um, counter conditioning is basically once you use positive reinforcement, you are, you are trained by positive reinforcement to understand and uh, the way you take this. If I reward something, the dog will do more of it. Okay? Very simple. So, tell the dog to sit and he sits. I don't know whether that's what I move my hand around, I do it, and the moment he sits, I reward him. So next time I move my hand around, he is going to sit and I'll get to sit. And slowly, slowly, I'll get reliability and finally I'll introduce the command that is sit. So that is how we use positive reinforcement. The more I reward the behavior, the more he will do it. Okay. Counter condition works the other way around. If it's for behaviors you don't want, and it's amazing the way it works. The dog which I was talking about in the video, the dog is right. We don't it to leave, give up biting through counter conditioning. Basically, uh, it is like we, uh, it's a biting dog. He's, let us say, I'm just using an example of a dog being aggressive when he sees another dog. So at the moment he sees another dog and he gets aggressive, before he can get aggressive, I reward that behavior. I just click and reward him. Okay? Or I just use my marker and I reward him. So now he's got, uh, conditioning logic teaches me that he's going to get more and more trained to show more aggressive behavior before, because he's getting rewarded by his body. And the conditioning logic doesn't work that way. It's like uh, I'm a big foodie, I'm very fond of food, and I'm also into fitness and I'm fond of running the marathon. Uh, you being a fitness person can understand both these things can't happen at the same time. You can you are either in game mode where you're like, okay, I have to run hard, or you're in eating mode, I have to eat. You can't while running so many days. I'm running, I want to win this race. I can't possibly think of the thing. So when a dog is getting into aggression, getting on one motion or one action, yeah. So his mode is that he's thinking of his mode to food. So his you are actually changing his brain, his state of mind. So when he sees another dog, his state of mind is changing. Every time he sees another dog, after a few repetitions, he sees another dog in the city. Another dog is not food. And that is the amazing thing of uh, counter conditioning, how it works. So if you do it well and you do it with good timing, which is a major thing, you will get a dog who is able to uh, change his whole mental state when he sees the same trigger which used to get him angry. So that's counter conditioning for you and uh, we, have, we can talk in detail some other time, but I just gave you an idea. Of uh, okay. okay, we have a question from Prabhu. Uh, once we have used food to train the dog, don't we need always to have food to make him listen? What happens when we don't have a food? When you have a treat or something like when you, so you start treating the when you start training the dog with treats, and once you don't have the treat, what happens? Can you still go with some other like say switch it on and bring in a toy or train him with a toy after if he doesn't have a food or something like that? Is it possible? Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry, I just muted you. Yeah, yeah, no. I would question Prabhu. Uh, Prabhu is one of our students only. And good to know you are here. Uh, now, um, when you ask whether, uh, I, I think uh, what you are trying to say is will the dog become dependent on food for the rest of his life or do I have to always carry food with me? So, my question would be what is the other alternative? 
Your other alternative is to use correction. And when you use correction, do you then need to carry whatever you're correcting with you, with you all your life? And let us say you're hitting him with a stick to make him listen. You and I know, I mean, trainers know that we don't actually do it for the rest of his life. And it beats a choke chain. We are able to teach a dog to move off leash with us because he's learned to give the behavior in a certain situation without getting the correction. As you move up the training ladder, the need for the correction uh, tools that you needed for the basic demand is not needed. The dog does, does that automatically. And but, uh, so similarly, it applies to counter uh, You don't need it here also. Even here, it is not needed uh, with not counter -country, positive reinforcement. You don't need it with food because when you are taking your dog out, uh, when you are teaching your dog, you are initially needing food to teach him the behaviors. But once he learns the behavior, you don't need food. And there is something called reverse layering. Uh, I wish I could show you the video, but uh, you can just check it out. A reverse layering is where we actually teach the dog to focus on the hand there, even when the food is right here. The food is here and he's looking at me and I'm telling him, sit down. After he says, I say, okay, then he gets the food. And he's working for the food, but the food doesn't have to be in my hand. Even if it's near in him, he's not looking at it. It's one of the tools we use in training to teach the dog that extra focus and to be a better trainer, better trained dog through this. So um, I don't think we need um, food to be carried with us all the time. Having said that, I still carry food with me all the time. I don't think it's such a bad thing to have. There's no harm in carrying a treat with you in the pocket. You need to. There's no harm in doing it. If, like, if I'm entering a competition, I know it's not allowed in the ring. I won't carry my food with my dog. And when I'm practicing with my dog, once in a week I practice without food. Just to make sure he is not so dependent. But otherwise, uh, that's for a competition dog. But from a house dog, they always know daddy has treats with him. They're always looking for me. He's come. There may be something popping out of his pocket. And anyway, I tell him, I tell him sit. And if out comes a treat, and the dog comes dragging his tail and happily eating what he's getting. So I don't think that's too bad a thing. No. Uh, just to follow up with this question, I have something to ask you as well. So let's say that you start training a dog with treats. Uh, so when you when you start with treats, do you always continue with treats or you can switch it between treats and toys? Uh, will the dog get confused between the two as such or will it be all right if you switch it, switch it in between? Just to give it some variance or, or do you stick to it? Variance is the word. Variance is the right word you use. So we call it a variable reward system. And it's a very important tool for the reinforcement. Uh, it's one of the things that get addicted to offering behavior. Now think of this. What is your mindset when you go to an ATM machine, you the card, you punch 100 rupees. What's your expectation? That I'll get 100 rupees. Isn't it? Are you happy with uh, or no money? You could not. You would say, why am I not doing that? I'm entitled to and I'm giving the behavior that you wanted. Your behavior is I should put the card and punch in the money I want. Why am I not getting the behavior that, I, that I'm that i entitled to? As against, if you're going to a slot machine, so you're going to a slot machine, you put the coin and you, you know, run the slots and something they all go around. Are you expecting every time you put the coin, you're going to get the jackpot? No. It's not a realistic expectation. And if you don't get you don't get anything, you don't get angry. I mean, what do you do? You take another coin and you put another coin. And again, and again, isn't it? That is what gambling addiction is all about. You just are hooked on there for the jackpot. And that is what variable reward is when you just ask whether I could use a toy. If the dog is very fond of a toy, that is my jackpot. I will keep that as the big prize that he's going to get uh, when he's, you know, someone has asked that question. Is the big prize he gets every now and then. So my dog is like, okay, this time is not, you know, paisa we can lose, but every now and then, when 2000 rupee note may come, and once in a while, we just get 10 crores. If, if I had someone like that, I would be just worshiping him all my life. So I'd say, yeah, he the dog. He gets time for that one crore, which comes once in maybe five days, once in, two, or once in two days, but he knows there will be a big reward coming sooner or later. The dog is hooked on to that variable reward. So, yes, you should use. Coming to your person, you should use a lot of different rewards. Don't just use one, then the dog thinks you think of you as an ATM machine. Okay, I give the behavior waste my food. I did this waste my food. If your dog is not fond of toys, you could get him to like it. And you should have different types of food. I use cheese, I use kibble, I use egg, 
I have different types of uh, cables also with me, and I know which one to use when. And uh, the dog is always expecting a bonanza any time now. Okay. Nice question. Good question, sir. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Okay, we have a question from uh, from Mr. Nitesh again. I think at what point uh, during the training session one can realize that we that uh, that what that is your action? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. At what point during the training session one can realize that what he is doing is a negative action? I think. I uh, saw another question. I think yeah. I think I. 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 If I'm right, I understood. There was another question Rajesh that you just put up. Yeah. Uh, which was that? Uh, there was another question which asked like, what do we do if the dog makes a mistake? Something to that effect I just saw on the screen. So uh, yeah, what happens to the dog makes a mistake? What do we do? I think he's talking about the same thing. Uh, so one thing is, the belief is that I told my dog to sit, and he should sit. And if he doesn't sit, this is where the problem comes. We trainers start interrupting. Not sitting because he's admit. He's not sitting because he wants to show he's the boss. He's not sitting because he of this. He's an aggressive dog. He's a rebellion. He doesn't listen. I heard this question. Uh, he's a big, not sitting. I just finished told. You have to beg him to say to sit. I'm just using sit as an example. So people think that maybe my dog has gone negative here. <laughs> and uh, in correction based training, it was very easy. The dog does a little back. Listen, back him. I mean, use the joke chain, give him a strong correction, and then he will. So every time the dog doesn't listen, you give him a correction, and then he's scared to not not listen. But whatever he says, you do. in positive reinforcement, we get, uh, we take disobedience, as it is called. As a learning step in the learning process, it is important for the dog to not do what he is told, for him to learn to do what he is told. If you understand, it sounds really complicated, but it's very simple. Which means the dog, I tell the dog sit, and he doesn't sit. All I need to do is I don't reward him. So he says, okay, he says sit, and I don't sit. I don't get a reward. And if he says sit, and I sit, I can get again the same thing. Plus, I send him one crore. So this is good. Sitting is good because if I do what he does, I may just get a jackpot. And if I don't, nothing happens. I think that difference between right and wrong, this big difference between right and wrong, is enough. Is I don't think I'm sure scientifically proven. I mean, whatever I speak here is science-based training. This is not something out of my experience only. This is something we studied and taught and understood. Uh, we have. Good tutor to come here and talk us, to contribute to the riders, and uh, through them I can tell you that you know uh, this is what science says that the animal learns very clearly that okay the behavior which is rewarding is the behavior that he wants to do. So if the dog makes a mistake, just ignore it. The dog makes a mistake. At the most, you can give him information. Okay. Say no. This is exactly how you say. Say sit. He says sit. I say no. And again I tell him sit. And then when he sits, I give him the food. Then he says, "Okay, it's no word can be used only to give information. I don't shout my head up, no, or anything like that, or you know, then other forms of action. This is all that using a lot of intimidation or fear is not positive reinforcement. That is your turn into positive punishment. But yes, uh, this is a question clearly. But if you are asking me at what point can I read if my dog is being negative?" I'm assuming you're saying that the dog is not doing what I'm saying, and if he's doing what, not doing what you're saying, we you just ignore it. Go back to your cue. Uh, a little, little bit about the cue. A cue is uh, the precursor of behavior. It's something I do which makes the dog give me the behavior that I want. I mean, using the example of sit, when I say sit, my dog sits. So in this case, the word sit coming out of my mouth is the cue. I would not use a verbal cue till my dog is, you know, reliable on behavior. Till I get him to sit when I'm telling him to, I will not uh, get him to. I won't use the word sit. So till I don't get him, till I, I would teach the dog to sit when I do this. If he sits every time I do this, then I'll say sit, and then I'll get the behavior. So go back a couple of steps in your training. There's no harm. A very important part of training is also to keep pushing your steps and going forward, which is absolutely fine. But when you go back a couple of steps. I mean, when you don't get success, be willing to go back. Don't make it an ego issue. Oh, boss, who are you trying to, you know, fool around with? You did this yesterday. Today you're not doing. I will make you do. No, no, no. Today maybe he didn't get it. Sometimes we think the dog has understood, but he is not. 
again in our training program courses we have training games it's amazing that in training games you become the dog and the trainer both of us work together i mean i don't know what the task is you try to get me to do it at the end of it my interpretation as a human being is different from what you want i think putting my hand on the head and you want it to warn me every time i blinked so sometimes we just don't understand so sometimes the same happens with the dog you think yeah yesterday you putting a hand on the head why are you not doing it today is because he thought it was blinking okay so okay. it could all be this so go back a couple of steps in your training practice it once you get success go ahead uh yeah the, uh, don't wait for 100% if you get around 80 90% success you know you're good for the next step so what training techniques are used in positive reinforcement sir hmm it's a good question again uh, positive reinforcement itself is not a technique positive reinforcement is a uh, is a theory of training so you use positive reinforcement i definitely can't use a choke chain i can't run with it i cannot give him jerks so what do i use so i would say the first four basic things that i would use would be capturing shaping luring and targeting so again i cannot get into too much detail on on each of these uh, methods uh, techniques of training but you can read it up and uh, understand that if you have these four skills with you you can use uh, positive reinforcement to train the dog and just the skills is not always enough uh, you should also know how to make plans you should be able to you know uh, plan your whole whole training and see the results and then compare that to what you had planned and then know whether you have to go forward or backward uh, that is one of the things we are we are covering in our upcoming course with, in this month month end and uh, you can learn to you know uh, how to learn how to plan and we we have good as i said good trainers like dr katya fre from uh, germany who is going to come and teach us planning and dog so if you learn from the right people and you know what to do uh, you can use the uh, positive reinforcement these techniques correctly okay. so uh, when ask uh, okay, when ask the dog obey or command the first time how will you know that what you mean like what is what what do you, how does the dog know that what you mean Like, yeah, yeah, I think I yeah, yeah. I think I just covered it. I was, that is what I say when I was giving you the example of sit. Uh, in positive reinforcement training, we do not give the command or the cue, the verbal cue, till I have uh, the behavior hundred uh, percent. Katya Frey says uh, you should be able to bet a day's salary, and if you convert it to Indian rupees, she says you should be able to bet a month's salary on when I do this particular action, my dog will give that behavior. so there are certain hand movements or depending on how we have used suppose i have used luring to teach my dog to sit and i have lured my hand this way then i know that when i do this with my hand my dog will start sitting by the second day once i do this this then i'll bring out his finger and i'll do this then i'll just do this and i'm getting a reliable sit every time i do this then i bring in the verbal cue then i say sit and when he does sit properly as per his story fade away this you again you can fade from the beginning and fade from the end which is again a another we have one full uh, days uh, discussion only on queuing and how to fade away the signals but uh, yes you can do uh, you have to first teach him the behavior be sure and reliable that you are getting the behavior then you bring in the queue if you just get a dog and they sit and he's looking at you what is that and then you don't know what then you you already made a commitment that you know he learns to disobey you on the day one Like you said, sir, he doesn't know what he's saying. Hey, come, 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 come and sit. And then you're getting into one uh, pushti with him and getting him to sit, and he's not liking it. I don't think uh, that's the right way to go. Which sadly is the way many people train. Uh, but uh, once you get reliable behavior, is only then you add a cue. Oh, okay, fine. So, okay. Ah, uh, in general, like uh, dogs, uh, are descendant of wolves, and they're all pack animals. So, do they need a a leader a strong leader for them to follow so are you the like that's like the leader part of it comes in your this thing as such or how does it come i'll just take a quick quick sip of water just yeah 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 good question again i'm very happy with the questions i'm getting um <clears throat> so now um see this is a bit like religions this whole uh, wolf uh, theory and this pack mentality and all that everyone believes what they have to believe um my belief comes from science what is my study of science as much as i have studied it's a huge body of work and uh, which is the way modern trainers think this nowadays i'll just tell a quick thing on how this whole pack mentality wolf thing came uh, 
dogs are descendants of wolves, no doubt, but that happened millions of years ago. First thing. So those traits in the dog are minimal, I would believe, not there in a major way. Uh, it does not define the dog that we have today because that many millions of years ago, uh, the, it split, or thousands of years ago, it split. The, not millions, or thousands of years ago, the dog split from the wolf, and the animal which came and decided to stay with the humans is our dog of today, as against the wolf which decided to stay in the wild. That's the first part. So this dog is not really so close to the wolf. Let us say the dog is still close to wolves, especially we like to believe dogs like Siberian and Huskies and Malamutes and such breeds we say are still close to the wolves. If I go back to such dogs, uh, the whole study of pack mentality and leader in the pack and all that was they was is out of wolves in confinement. The wolves were kept in confinement and those wolves were studied. And among those wolves, this was observed that they have a pack and they have a leader of the pack and then the first fights with the second, second fights with the third, so on and so forth. To, de to decide who's the boss. And all the study on pack mentality of wolves has come from wolves in confinement, as against the dogs who descended from wolves in the wild. They didn't descend from the wolves in confinement. So the, the basis of the study, again, that was on wolves in confinement, this is on wolves in reality. If at all, we have to believe the dogs do carry some of the traits which of the wolves that they were common, then that means we also carry some of the traits of the monkeys. Let us say we believe that. Those traits are not of a real wolf, they're of a, they're of a Wolf in pack, uh, wolf in a uh, confinement. Like in my opinion, it doesn't apply. I have few more points on why that does not apply and how I don't believe it, but I don't want to get into so much detail. But these are the two major points that I would say why uh, pack mentality theory. I mean, what do they call it? Dominance theory. Yeah. This dominance theory doesn't hold good. And furthermore, there are further explanations that if dominance theory did hold good, then what would happen? One of the major things with dominance theory is that it is used for. Uh, for the uh, what do you say leader to establish his, his sexual dominance on the pack that I am the main the main you know leader of this gorilla pack or this wolf pack and all the females are going to come and mate with me. Whereas we know dogs, lovely creatures, everything good about them, but they are promiscuous by nature. A female will get mated by ten males, so there is no need for you to be the leader of the pack. Even if you are tenth in you, you will get a chance because that is how sadly dogs are. So again, it is not needed. So, so on and so forth. There are so many arguments. So I, first of all, don't believe in the fact that the pack mentality applies to you know, to dogs. And in continuation, uh, neither do the dogs need a leader. They, that is why they don't need this, this whole pack mentality thing. Uh, I'm sorry to say that I myself taught it to my students. Some of them, as I said, are listening, might be listening. Ten years back, I was teaching them about this whole uh, you know pack mentality and how you need to be the boss and you need to feed the dog after you eat for him to know from day one who the boss is. When he comes, you need to put him down, let him know who is the boss in the house. Otherwise, he will think that he needs to be the boss. I have been through all this. I have taught it myself. And I am telling it here that I was wrong. And there is no shame in accepting when you are wrong, you were wrong. So that is where I was. And uh, today, I can tell you confidently that that is not how the animal works. It is just an animal, like any other animal, which will behave depending on what is the more rewarding behavior. If there is more rewarding behavior, uh, something is more rewarding, he will do that. If it is rewarding for him to growl and all of you leave, leave the room and leave the bed to him, then what do you think he's going to do? He says, this works. And I growl, they all leave the room and leave the bed with the AC on for me. Good. Every time I'm going to do that, that does not mean that he's you know, thinking I'm the leader of this house. He just realizes that, that is what works. Give him something else to do, counter condition him, teach him that this doesn't work. You know, you use your brain. And uh, you know, there's only ways in which we... We are much smarter than these animals, and we should be able to. And we are, and uh, with the positive reinforcement, uh, uh, we are followers. One of the major, um, you know, students or prodigies of this animal is uh, of positive reinforcement is Bob Bailey from US, and he has this animal training college. And uh, what not has he taught? From cockroaches to bears to lions to tigers to rhinoceros, he's trained uh, more than 100, 100 species of animals. So why will it not work on a dog? You just you need to be smarter than the dog. We are. Sometimes we act less. Okay, uh, this gentleman has asked whether he can do positive reinforcement training on a boxer. I'm just going to modify this question to a different uh, this thing. Okay, uh, I mean, uh, what are the dogs that are easy to train in positive reinforcements and which you feel that are difficult or it takes a longer time? This, these are the breeds which are easy to train in positive reinforcement. These are breeds that actually takes a longer time 
is there anything like that or like are all breeds in such uh, like when you start from an early age it's easy for them to like learn from fostering so no, no there's no such thing as uh, uh, you know <laughs> breed wise uh, then, uh, I'm sorry, this question is coming in, and I feel so disheartened to hear it at the end of this discussion. It is like saying all this time. <laughs> I hope this person just Randi again. He's a member of I can team I Randi. So uh, I just hope you just logged in and you didn't hear anything when you're asking this question. And uh, if that's the case, I would like to say that positive reinforcement you can train anything. I mean, any living creature. Let me put it that way. It's wonderful for training uh, dogs as well. You can use it on. Uh, Husbands and wives and children. It works on humans. <laughs> it works on tigers. It works on lions. Uh, it works on every every creature out there. And uh, it's just the same rules that have to be applied differently. Naturally, if I can get my dog to you know obey with kibble, that same kibble is not going to work on my wife and my uh, children, isn't it? So I have got to ask what my wife uses for me. But uh, otherwise, uh, you have to have the right reward. And be able to offer it the right timing, and you will get the behavior you want. And so, it is nothing to do with breeds. It is not a breed-specific uh, thing that only certain dogs, or certain breeds, can be taught to positive reinforcement. There is a feeling, I would say, that uh, dogs with aggression, which is the question we already got, cannot be taught to positive reinforcement because the dog is going to bite off my hand. How do I get him to eat food? So, I would say that is the dog you first build a relationship with through counter conditioning. Uh, you know, slowly just teach him uh, and get him out of the aggression, and then you come to the behaviors. So, with, for that dog, you will have to change the way you come to the behavior training, which is teaching the command that sit, stand down. You will do for such a dog later, but uh, the solution is always positive training, uh, positive reinforcement. Randeep. Hey, okay. Uh, we'll just uh, wind it up with the last question, uh, Philip. Okay. What are the most important points that you keep in mind? Can you can just sum it up? In like few words, and tell what exactly the, the like uh, to do. Keep in mind when you start training in positive reinforcement. I just hope I don't miss out on some anything. Uh, but I would say the most important thing when I think of positive reinforcement, the first thing that comes to mind is timing. I mean, uh, one is I think number one would be timing, <clears throat> because if you don't get the timing right, the dog does not know what he is being rewarded for. A dog has got a certain attention span, and uh, if it comes within one or two seconds of that, he knows, oh, this is the behavior which gets rewarded. If you miss the timing, then you lost it. I mean, the ship has sailed. Then you're rewarding him. He doesn't know what he's thinking. Like I, my dog looks at me and I then I take out my food and I reward him. By the time he's looking at another dog, then he thinks that, okay, when I look at another dog, daddy gives me a treat. So I need, first and foremost would be timing. I won't put it in a specific order because now more things are coming to mind. They also seem pretty important. And uh, it has to be worthwhile for the dog. Bob Bailey says that it has to be worthwhile for the dog. This is one of his uh, famous statements. And when he says worthwhile for the dog, it is, you may think that this is the best treat in the world, but if your dog doesn't want it, it's of no use. Okay, so you will be carrying uh, some currency which is not accepted in India. And if I keep offering lots of those notes to you, liras to you, what use is it, is it to you? You think, I don't want it. I cannot go and buy one idli with it. So why would I do anything for it? So it has to be worthwhile for the dog, and it has to be at the right time. You have to be consistent. When I'm talking about positive reinforcement, what is the other thing? I would say learn. Uh, don't positive reinforcement should uh, not be something you would experiment with. I would always advise you to go out and find the right sources. We are there. The Obedience and Agility Club is there with the Kennel Club yeah, of India. People even also ask where we can learn uh, positive reinforcement. I think uh, you are seeing the best man on the screen right now where you can learn it from. You can always reach out to him. Please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we, we do. Yeah. So, we do conduct such courses. So, the Obedience and Agility Club is there. Kennel Club of India has uh, created a separate body just to promote obedience in India and training. And they are very strong uh, advocates of positive reinforcement. So uh, you can approach them, and of course there are uh, private players like myself. When I say myself, not the Hyderabad Canine Club, but uh, the Commando Kennels, Commando College for Trainers. We train people on how to, you know, uh, use positive reinforcement. Learn from the right people. Learn science-based training. Hear the words. I mean, if someone is saying, "I will teach you balance training," is you going to use correction? Avoid that person. Uh, go to a place which is reputed and uh, teaches you from the right sources. Is what I'd say. Also, I would like to mention, I saw that question, someone asked me, asked that question, 
I was hoping you would ask me, but I want to quickly cover that as well. So they give me another. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Is that uh, someone asked why do we use chicken to train? Because that is something we do. So uh, chicken is an excellent excellent model to learn training. Uh, whoever has undergone a chicken training course with me has told that it has it has been a life changing uh, moment for them, just as it was for me. When I trained with the chicken for the first time, it was I was already had some twenty years of dog training experience, so maybe more. And when my mentor kept telling me you need to do a chicken training camp, Ilka, I think he's online. He said he said hi. So uh, thank you, Ilka, for taking me to a chicken training camp to learn chicken chicken training, and it helped me to you know change my uh, mindset and understand how uh, uh, positive training works. And it's very fast to learn those basic foundation skills. Uh, when when you ask me what are the important parts of uh, importance of uh, uh, positive training, another important thing is mechanical skills. so timing and mechanical skill you learn it perfectly with chicken training so it's not that you want going to go and train a chicken i i may have eaten the chicken or given it to someone it's another story so i don't want to someone had put uh, one thing on facebook uh, this guy is teaching uh, you know uh, people to train chicken uh, uh, when here is my here is a small girl holding a chicken can the small girl not handle a rottweiler that was the question which was asked An aggressive Rottweiler through chicken training. How do you learn to handle an aggressive Rottweiler? Sorry, my friend. Through chicken training, you can train a lion and a tiger and a bear. Can you put a chicken and a spike collar on them? So, if you know the uh, the fundamentals of positive training, yeah, you can train any any animal. So, what is a Rottweiler or any other breed or boxer like Randiras? So, uh, I would like to close this. Uh, I must uh, also mention that we are very fortunate. We since. Uh, uh thank you madras can enter first of all for this and also petitia who host a wonderful event we are partners with them and we conduct this wonderful event in hyderabad this year in december and we over there we do have such seminars where we give a lot of knowledge free and uh, it is a wonderful platform for people to come and meet and i thank petex and the hitex team for conduct uh, for helping us with this because uh, uh, nitish would also initially help us with trying to get this both of us on the screen and get us on live Yeah, but finally we could get it done through the uh, help of Petex, and I thank them. And I request everyone to do visit Petex whenever you are in Hyderabad, or come down to Hyderabad to visit that event as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Philip, for spending this uh, valuable time with us, educating the people on positive reinforcement or uh, training a dog through positive reinforcement. Uh, guys, you can always reach out to Philip. Uh, I think uh, he's tech savvy, and he's got his Facebook and uh, Twitter and And what not? So, and I think uh, Commander Ganas is one of the foremost people in uh, in dog training in in India. So you can always reach out to him. You can ask questions. And uh, I know Philip for a very long time, and he's someone who answers even the silliest questions. Believe me, I have asked some silly questions as well. So he's uh, he's one person who will sit and explain and answer all your questions. So you can always reach out to him if you have any more questions. Thank you for joining us uh, in this wonderful evening. Uh, we have another guest lined up for next week. Uh, keep watching our uh, Facebook and Instagram page. We will be putting up uh, the post very shortly on the topic and the uh, and the specialist who is going to talk about the topic as well. So uh, once again, thank you, uh, thank you, Philip. Thanks, Petex, for making thank you, this. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Petex is given. Uh, thanks, guys. So see you soon. Stay, stay home, stay safe, and uh, see you next week. Thanks, thanks, a lot, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye.